everybody. Happy Wednesday. Welcome back to another episode of the Proud to Work in Cannabis podcast. Really excited today to have Graham Farrar, who's the president and chief cannabis officer at Glass House. Graham and I have been working on getting this episode on the books for a long time. We finally got it going. Graham, how are you today? I'm awesome. Thanks a lot for having me, Carson. I'm uh, proud to be here to talk about being proud to work in cannabis. Well, actually, let's start there. If you, There's a bazillion reasons to be proud to work in cannabis, but if you had to narrow it down to just one, let, let's hear for the audience, why are you proud to work in cannabis? Um, I think cannabis makes the world a better place. So I'm happy that we and the Glasshouse team and the rest of the folks in this industry, um, if you know, it's not easy. So if, if you're not here for the passion and the belief that you're making the world a better place, making a company that employees uh, are happy to work at, making products that make people healthier and happier, creating jobs, generating tax revenue, helping end the war on drugs, helping get you know the 2,700 prisoners that are still uh, cannabis POWs in the prison out, then, uh, then you know there's lots of easier things to do. So I think just fundamentally, we believe that cannabis makes the world a better place. And so more cannabis for more people uh, makes the world that much better. Once cool thing I always think about in the cannabis industry and every time I hear someone say something like that it's like even competitors all do have a common goal to make cannabis accessible for everybody to end the war on drugs to get people out of prison to drive tax revenues to make cannabis safe I mean like where else I, I can't think of another I really can't think of too many other industries where the common goal is like so aligned yeah yeah as so aligned and uh, a higher purpose in, in many ways, right? I mean, it's I sometimes joke cannabis is medicine that's so good that people take it just for the side effects, right? Like at the end of the day, the way that we got here and um, is because cannabis is a way to improve, you know, feel better with plants, right? And I think, um, you know, fundamentally that's a, that's a mental shift that maybe many in our society are going through right now is this idea that, you know, we're identical and part of nature, not sitting on top of it. And so, where we can use nature to improve the quality of life and the quality of our society, like that should be the first line of defense, right? And we're coming out of a, a world where pharmaceuticals and chemicals and things like that tended to be the first line of defense. I mean, I'm sure you've heard the stories, right? It's like someone's dying of cancer and finally when nothing's left, that's when they try cannabis, right? And the idea that we can flip that over on its head is, is, a, is a much bigger than business. It's much bigger than money. It's it's really, you know, for the kind of the global global goodness. And I think that um, for the most part, you know, the people who are in this industry ha have at least a, a piece of that in, in them. And, you know, especially the folks who have been doing it for a long time. You, you didn't you didn't end up here unless you love the plant, love what it did for yourself and your friends and, you know, by extension, the world at large. So I do think it's a uh, it's a business, but it's also a business with a higher societal goal, which is a really fun thing to put together. Yeah, I listened to Dr. Mark Hyman's podcast. It's called like Doctor's Pharmacy, and it's the, and I've been really focused on functional medicine. And you know, I think a uh, like a line that he uses over and over again is like treating the treating the the soil, where in, rather than treating uh, the vegetables. So to your point around like you know cannabis being the last resort for people with patients, rather than folks using it before they even get cancer. I mean, I think that's just so incredible. I mean, there's just, I mean, listen, I'm, I, I hate, I, if I avoid medicine at all costs, right. If I can never take medicine again, I, I, I would never. And I just think like, it, it's amazing that people can now turn to a plant, a cannabis, rather than taking these drugs that are addictive and people get on them for the rest of their lives. Like, you know, my, my mom, pretty young, like she's like 60, she went to the doctor for some issue with her stomach and they want to put her on medication for the rest of her life. And it's like, that sounds like a horrible, horrible, horrible idea. And the only person that wins is the pharmaceutical company. Yeah. Yeah. No, I know. I mean, we're, we're far afield uh, for a, uh, a work podcast, but it's absolutely uh, true that, and I, and I think, you know, the good news is I think that, that these ideas are spreading, right? In Western medicine for all the amazing things uh, that it can do. It treats symptoms. It doesn't tend to treat underlying causes, right? I mean, the standard there, and you see it like we, uh, you know, we do a lot with senior citizens at, a, at some of our stores, and you see it there really clearly, right? They're one of the most over-medicated pieces of our population, right? And again, it's this, 
take this medicine because your stomach hurts. Oh, okay, well, that kills your appetite, so take this. And now you're constipated, so take this. And now your blood pressure's here, so take this. And, and it really happens, you know, senior citizens, they even have a name for it called uh, sundowner syndrome, where they are layered on so many different pharmaceuticals, some just treating the other pharmaceuticals, where if you can come back, and again, this is the you know, first line of defense, certainly there's things where medicine is, is, is the holy grail, but for so many things, it's, you, you take cannabis and it balances your endocannabinoid system, which is a system built for homeostasis, which is a fancy word for balance, helps your appetite, helps your sleeping, it re- you know, it lowers your cortisol levels, and all of a sudden you get the cascading effect of you know, one natural plant coming from mother nature, never killed anybody, not addictive, etc., is now replaced like you know eight or nine different you know pharmaceutical compounds that you won't find anywhere necessarily in nature and, and i do i think more functional medicines happening more connections with fungi and you know things you know uh, and that whole world of again realizing that we are identical with nature and not on top of it and allowing nature has most of the solutions that we need if we just open our eyes and look for them well i know we just went uh, a little bit off topic there, but it's, it's a, you know, listen, l- longevity space is a space I'm super passionate about and spending a ton of my time on. And there's cannabis fits just so perfectly, perfectly into it. But, but to, to bring us back on track. So you went to CU Boulder. So, uh, I'm in, I'm in Denver. Actually, my younger sister went to CU Boulder and you studied molecular biology and biochemistry. So why did you decide you know, you know, you always had an interest in this or what, you know, what made you decide just like the degree that, that you were going to pursue? Yes. Yeah, so originally my plan when I went to Boulder was to go to medical school. So I've always kind of, I, I enjoy the health aspect. I enjoy technology. I enjoy, or, you know, aspire to doing things that, you know, help people and, and make the world a little bit better than it was when I got here. And so um, my original plan uh, was, molecular biology and biochemistry on to medical school, be a doctor of some kind. Um, I've always been a tech uh, geek um, since the early days of computers. I've just enjoyed the technology and figuring out how things work. Um, and at the same time, had a passion for cannabis first as a consumer, uh, then as a grower. And so my first cannabis grow was actually in in, in a closet in that, uh, in that apartment in Boulder. It was, you know, a little two foot by three foot ebb and flood system with a 600 watt HPS light and, you know, a timer. So it was automated and uh, CO2 supplementation and, you know, a couple cinder blocks to separate the reservoirs. And I grew six uh, plants and, and Rockwell blocks. And, you know, that A was the best weed I could find and B uh, gave me a little bit of income um, so that I could take my then girlfriend, now wife, uh, out to dinner and uh, and steal her out of the dorms and the cafeteria food, so she would h- hang out with me uh, until she learned that she uh, that she loved me, and um, and that just you know kind of went from there. And I, I continued to do it um, on the side, you know, first in a room, and then in a garage, and then in a house, and then in a couple of houses. Uh, I also was one of the original folks over at Sonos, which is like a iPod home audio system. Um, and so, you know, on the one hand, developing the Sonos uh, system during the day and uh, had a garage full of uh, uh, weed plants uh, that I tended to at night. And um, then eventually, um, I guess, you know, eight, almost eight years ago now, uh, made the transition from doing it as a hobby to doing it full time when we started Glasshouse Farms uh, in Santa Barbara with our first 150,000 square foot greenhouse. Yeah. So when you, so eight years ago, when you decided that you were going to take the hobby and make it full time, I'm always super curious to hear like how it went from idea to actual thing. And so it was brewing in your mind. What were the steps that you took to go about getting the 150,000 square foot, you know, facility? Yeah. So lucky, um, Santa Barbara is my hometown um, and lucky, I mean, it's a big agricultural community. Um, you know, people know it more for the, the Montecitos and the Oprahs. But if you look at the entire you know, county of uh, 500,000 people or so, it's one of the largest uh, agricultural counties in, in California because it's a fantastic place to grow things. It's you know, close to the ocean, so it never gets too hot. It's sunny. It's uh, got that kind of perfect, you know, 72 and sunny uh, California climate almost year round. Um, the Dutch and Japanese farmers, many, you know, in the sixties, probably, uh, scoured the United States. Uh, they're great farmers by, you know, kind of tradition and, and culture. And they came across the U S and found, uh, an area in Santa Barbara called Carpinteria, 
where they built a bunch of really nice greenhouses and the typical kind of Dutch style. Um, and they originally were going to cut flowers there and that was my backyard. And had grown cannabis and, and been growing weed in Santa Barbara for a long time. And the opportunity came up uh, when I met you know, my partner, Kyle, who's a real estate guy. Uh, who also believed uh, in the end, ending the war on drugs. And how, how did you and Kyle meet, by the way? Yeah, so uh, it's it's a it's a it's a funny story. So uh, I originally tracked down the greenhouse um, for somebody. Who said you know, kind of, hey, let's partner, let's find the nicest greenhouse uh, that we can. And so I tracked down. It wasn't for sale. It was a Dutch uh, grower, and I think he thought I was nuts. I think he probably thought he was, um, you know, charging me, ripping my face off in terms of the price. Um, but we believed in what we were doing and that Santa Barbara was a good place to do it. And so um, that turned into, you know, it's cannabis, so you can't get a mortgage, you can't get a loan. There's no small business association. All the normal tools that you have uh, when you want to start a business are missing from cannabis. Um, uh, and that's when I came, Kyle and I met each other, and he was a real estate guy. He was t used to doing kind of distressed real estate deals and, you know, you know hairy, you know, things that aren't the normal you know, office buildings and things like that. And so cannabis uh, was right up his alley because it didn't, you know, again, it was it was different than everything else. And he believed uh, and that, you know, ending the war on drugs uh, is a good thing and believed that cannabis uh, was a good business and was good for you know the world like I did. And so he uh, became my landlord and first investor um, when we started Glass House. And so uh, he bought the property and I became the tenant and um, him and uh, his business partner invested to help me get get it started and off the ground. And uh, we liked what we were doing there. So we decided another greenhouse came up for sale, uh, you know, not too far away in Santa Barbara. And so we decided to kind of do do it again with a lot, slightly bigger uh, greenhouse. This was about the time that we were transitioning from Prop 215 to Prop 64. So the rules were changing and, and our kind of view on the world was, you know, for a long time, the number one priority as a grower was don't get caught, right? It was, you gotta be able to hide because, uh, the you know law enforcement and the laws were were your enemy and as as prop 64 came around we you know thought that that was going to change right it was going to move to a licensing model growing well growing efficiently growing consistently we're going to become the new priority and so we went looking for the place which again you know santa barbara is my hometown so we're lucky that the kind of that backyard was an area that i knew well and um that it was a great place to grow which is why those greenhouses ex existed and so as we moved into the licensing model we worked uh, to get those greenhouses licensed and, you know, kind of tear off into the, the new next phase of, of cannabis uh, under the license model. So in the early days when you got the first facility, Kyle was your landlord and first investor, you're getting ready to open up. What kind of people did you, like, how did you build out that original version of the team and like, who, who, who did you hire and what, what, for what kinds of roles? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, it, one of the things, a big thing with cannabis, uh, with can uh, cannabis at the time particularly and still now but uh when you're when you're growing weed back in you know 2015 or whatever trust was a, was a really big factor so one of the things i did was i went to my friends uh, our head director of cannabis operations to this day uh as a good buddy of mine named jason who i went to high school with and we've known each other since we were probably 15 years old and he's been growing weed for 30 years so uh i went to him as uh you know to help on the grow side um, was he like, holy shit, this is so cool. You're offering me a job <laughs> as a real grower, like with a real salary. Yeah, I mean, I hope so. He, he said yes, and, uh, and he's still here and doing an awesome job. So um, I think ho hopefully the, uh, you know, the, the results and the, and the actions speak to, to, the, to that. Um, and he's a great grower. I mean, he understands the plant uh, as well or better than anybody I've come across. Uh, we sometimes joke that he's the weed whisperer here. Um, and, you know, at the time, 150,000 square feet was like the biggest thing any of us could imagine, right? It was massive. Uh, it was a little bit scary even, right? I mean, that was this was still Prop 215 when we started. So, you know, we had a binder with all of our uh, our recs and here's the number of the attorney. And if the sheriff ever comes and knocks on the door, <laughs> here, I mean, it was back in the days where we were trying to follow every rule that we know how. We had recs, we were collected, we were all the things, but that was still in the world of, you know, as long as the, sh you know, as long as the authorities agreed with you, if they didn't, 
they could certainly mess with you. And so we had, you know, that was that kind of, you didn't, you didn't talk about it back then. So, which goes back to the trust side of things and working with people. So like when I opened the pharmacy, which was our first dispensary in Santa Barbara, uh, the general manager who opened that's a, another good friend that I've known since 14 named, uh, named Leah, who helped me open that store and ran it for the first three years and is still here and now responsible for marketing across all of our 10 retail stores. So, you know, I think it was it was a very much a, a friend network. Uh, Devin, who was probably employee number one, was a uh, the daughter of one of Kyle's, I think it was, uh, longtime employees. So she was young and she was there uh, to help. And she's still here now as a you know, senior director of operations eight years later. And you know, probably has as much more experience in cannabis than uh, than you know anybody else on the planet in many ways. So it's been really fun to you know it, we call it the farmly, which is a part part farm, part family, uh, and a lot of you know a lot of folks have been here since day one, and a lot of them are, are people that I've known since junior high. You know, I, I I love that, and I actually just had the folks from Curio in. Marilyn on the show, Fam, to, you know, family business, uh, 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 father, daughter started, then they brought in the sister and the brother. And my sister works here at Vangst. Uh, my, my dad helps on and off. And I know that there's some like stigma that goes around town with hiring friends and family, but to your point around trust, like we've over the years, even at Vangst, which is not a massive company, have had like so much crazy stuff happen with employees and it just doesn't happen when it's your good friend that you've known since you were 14 like there it just like does not seem to happen and so I'm with you on hiring um a, a definitely early hiring people you know you trust whether you've worked with them together whether you've gone through hard times together whether you've been on a sports team together um and you know their work ethic so you're not going to hire a, a, a bozo that's not going to work hard you know that's the whole thing when people are like you know you shouldn't hire your friends it's like I shouldn't hire my friends that are idiots because we all have those friends, right. <laughs> but we know not to hire those ones. Yeah, yeah. You shouldn't, you shouldn't hire your friend because they're your friend. You should hire your friend if you can with somebody who's an expert in what they're doing, exactly. right? So like if you, can, if you have the right person and they're your friend, then that's, that's, a, that's a double win. Like the because, weed, you know, whisper, the weed whisperer sounds like yeah. the perfect friend for this job. Right. So yeah. as you guys started scaling, of course, you're like, all right, we're scaling. We've got some people that we know and trust in, like the Weed Whisper and Devin and Layla, and you've got you know you kind of the core squad. How did you think about expanding? Because I mean, how many employees do you guys have now? We're probably upwards of five hundred. Yeah, upwards of five hundred. So how did you think about taking that early day culture of everybody doing everything? This is our baby. We know every single reg. If the sheriff shows up, everyone knows what to do. Everyone's all in. Uh, you know family pharmacy like how did you scale that culture and, and find the next people to bring in yeah so i mean i think cu culture is really important um i think it's kind of the foundation of of everything else and it the bigger you get the more intentional you need to be with creating the culture that you want i think it, it kind of naturally happens in small teams and it, it only happens with intention and, and larger teams um and so i think you know we We've got a no asshole policy, which is I don't you know don't care how good you are at something if you're an asshole we don't we don't have room for you so we really want to have the right group dynamic we want experts and we want professionals and we, we want people who know uh, know their shit better than anybody else but we don't want people who break the inner workings and the interpersonal dynamics because that's you know you can be awesome at something but if you break that it's you know you're it's it's you're you're losing ten dollars for every penny you pick up. Uh, if the culture starts to break down um, and it's hard. And I, I mean, I think it, and it ebbs and flows is, is the reality, right? I mean, there's times when the vibes are great and then you'll go through a transition and, and scale or a new facility or a new, you know, opening or a new hire or whatever. And like, you know, you got, it's like a, it's like balancing a BB on a pane of glass, right? You like, you, you take your, your eye off it for a second and all of a sudden it's, you know, falling off the edge. And so it really does, I think, you know, take a constant diligence. Um, and there's no such thing as perfect. It's always kind of a journey to uh, trying to be a little bit better today than you were yesterday, but it, it really is important. And so we definitely look for people who we feel kind of, you know, get the, get the glass house vision um, or gritty um, or experts um, believe in what they're, they're doing 
believe that you always are trying to do the right thing. Um, so, you know, that's, that's where we start. And then, then you got to be the right fit, the right expertise, and the right skill set. With the no asshole policy, if someone's an asshole, do you just say you're fired for being an asshole? Or how do you, like, actually enforce that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think if, if you really do well in your culture, I, I think a lot of times it, it's almost like your body re rejecting a, a, a virus, right? So it doesn't, it doesn't sometimes happen instantly, but the, with the right culture, when somebody doesn't fit the the organization oftentimes takes care of it. And, and it's, you know, it's like, it's like when you get a splinter, right? You know, your body kind of like attacks onto it and it swells up and you can look at your finger and you can see the red dot, right? Even if you can't see the splinter, you can see the reaction to it. And as long as you kind of keep, you know, your ears and your antenna open, a lot of times the organization will tell you when, when there's a problem and then you just need to do what you need to do as a manager and a leader to, Take care, take care of it. And a lot of times, you know, it's not necessarily, sometimes the assholes is not, they're an asshole, they're just in the wrong spot, right? There may be another culture, another place where, where they're fine. And so it's, it's less about judging the person and more about judging the match uh, between the company, I mean, between the, the individual and the organization. So, of course, California has had, it's, it's kind of like a rough year. We do our annual jobs report where we say, here's how many jobs are created in each state. And for the first year ever, California cannabis industry lost, lost jobs. I think they lost like 18,000 jobs. We've seen a handful of our customers, actually more than a handful of our customers, go out of business, close down. You guys have remained really resilient. How have you done it when so many others have not? Yeah, so I mean, I think the, the first place to start with is we need to focus on the system because I think that's that's what's causing so much of this, right? I mean, we're five years into Prop 64. Under, under Prop 215, we probably had five or 6,000 dispensaries, right? We're five years into Prop 64 and now we have 1,000 dispensaries, right? And of course, there's more, but those more are illicit dispensaries which don't fit into the where we're, we're trying to take you know the overall system so people in california voted for prop 64 because they wanted more access to cannabis and if you look around five years in i'd say that they have less 60 percent of the municipalities still don't have a legal store that's open the store is where you access the customers and that's where the rest of the supply chain you know it lives or dies is because if you can't reach a customer because the customer doesn't have a dispensary then you can't support a brand, which means you can't support a farm, which means you can't have employees. So, you know, we our access is too limited. We need more retail. Our taxes are too high. We need to lower the taxes. The regulations are still treating cannabis like it's some form of nuclear waste. And the way that we continue to stigmatize it everywhere along the chain from the, the state to the insurance to the building permits to the county regulations puts an amazing amount of friction on something that's actually helpful. I mean, we, we call cannabis medicine, but then we tax it like it's a vice, right? You know, cigarettes kill 150,000 people a year. Alcohol is pretty similar. Fentanyl is in the same range, right? Those things are all scheduled as safer than cannabis. None of them are taxed like cannabis. Tax on a bottle of wine is like a four cents. Tax on a joint is $1.40, right? So like the, those are the fundamental things. We still don't have interstate commerce. Right. I think you, you mentioned California specifically here. The rest of the country wants California cannabis. And right now they can't get it in a legal way. If you change, change that, all of a sudden the California cannabis industry takes off. Small farms work, big farms work, brands work. So, I mean, I think that is the that's the underlying fundamental problem that we need to be focused on fixing for everyone's good. Consumers here, can, businesses here, tax receipts here, all the above. How do you think it? How do you think that it gets fixed? I mean, I, this, you know, we had, I don't know if it, it might have even been you, you and me that were having this conversation. I can't remember if I was having it with you or Kyle, but like we've been, it's not like we've, this is the first time we're having this conversation. I feel like people have been having this conversation for a long time and a lot of people just couldn't, you know, I think the advice a lot of people were getting was like, just hold on, just make it through, just make it through. And people are like, okay, how much longer am I going to hold on for? So like, what do you think has to, ha I mean, like, what do you think happens here? So um, 
I think it does work out in the end. It is certainly slower than I would have thought. Um, the things that I think that give me optimism right now is uh, if you start at the federal level, I think the rescheduling, descheduling conversation happening with the Health and Human Services Secretary, Javier Becerra, um, who supposedly is going to have comments back by the end of the year, which at this point is you know five months away. Um, Javier was these attorney general for California. He's, his signature is what actually legalized cannabis for adult use in California. So we know um, he's experienced and knowledgeable and not an, a, a, opposed to it or an opponent of it. Um, I think the science clearly points to the fact that it should be descheduled. Um, so I think that progress there, we would love to see it descheduled. Schedule three is the rumor, would still be significant incremental progress. Because that would remove 280E, right? As long as it's not Schedule 1 or set, Schedule 2. Is, I mean, is that... Yeah, three, three, three or lower are, um, would get rid of 280E. Um, I think the thing it doesn't do um, is it doesn't get anybody out of prison. So that's, you know, descheduling, I think, would set the course um, to get people out of prison, which is important for those people, their families, us. It should be important for the industry. Um, but it would still be incremental progress, and I don't want to be the person, as much as we want that, I don't want to be the one that says, you know, I don't, I don't want to Cory Booker it and say everything or nothing, because what we've seen is we get nothing then, um, and that doesn't make any progress. So I, I, think there's, I think there's good reason to be optimistic there. Um, I think if you listen to the head of the FDA, um, again, somebody who is not looking to incarcerate people who I don't think has opposition to cannabis, I think is looking for fresh direction. Um, I'm, I think there's optimism there. Uh, there's another guy whose name is Norm Bierman, uh, who's the first ever um, cannabis, or uh, maybe they call it marijuana, but you know, the can cannabis person within the FDA is his responsibility. He came out of Connecticut, New Hampshire, maybe it was Rhode Island, um, where he helped to legalize cannabis in those states. So, again, I think you have somebody who's, you know, this is not a Kevin Sabat of Sam, you know, clown car makeup stories about cannabis. These are people who are at the very least open minded, and if not proponents of there being a better way to do this. Um, so I think that's that has optimism. I think uh, the governors, you know, if you look at California, Oregon, Washington, all have interstate commerce laws on the books. All of them are campaigning for it. Um, if you look at New Jersey, they're looking at interstate commerce to import. Uh, can that, um, Washington, D.C. is also looking at interstate commerce um, at, at, a, at a local level. Um, I think as Pennsylvania that I have, has interstate commerce and importing cannabis baked in to their initial legalization efforts. So I think there's lots of reasons that, you know, you can see this idea of interstate commerce packs coming around the corner. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, 100 percent of all legalization progress has been led by the states, 100 percent. So if I look to what I think is going to happen next, history doesn't necessarily repeat itself, but usually it rhymes. And I would say that interstate commerce packs between states are likely the, the next fastest path. And if you could layer that on with a rescheduling or descheduling, I think we could finally see some movement that would actually make a difference for people, you know, consumers, you know, you put. It's crappy weed in New Jersey for three times the price of what you can buy in California. That's twice as good. So, you know, there's a reason that oranges come from Florida and corn comes from Iowa and strawberries come from California and wine comes from California. It's because we're a country that wants to optimize. We're a big country with massive resources and you want to do the right thing in the right place. And right now we're forced in these silos with cannabis and it forces all kinds of increased cautions and efficiencies you know, it's not great. For the, it's horrible for the consumer. It's an environmental travesty. So I'm a, I'm a believer that, you know, the truth always happens. Uh, and the truth is, is that cannabis can be done much better than it is in a beneficial way and that we're making progress, even though it's slower than we wish it was. I agree with you that. But I feel like there's so many people in the industry that don't want um, interstate commerce because they don't want to shut down their grow facility in the middle of nowhere, Massachusetts, where they're trying to attempt to grow cannabis, you know, in the snow. Obviously, it doesn't really make that much sense because, you know, to your point, you can, no one's buying oranges in 
I don't really know much about oranges, but I know they come from Florida, <laughs> right? Like it just yeah. makes common sense. They don't sense. come out of warehouses. I'll tell you that. They don't come out of warehouses. And so, it, but it does seem like a lot of people are advocating uh, for the other point. And obviously from where you sit, it would greatly benefit you if there was, uh, I mean, everybody in the world would get their cannabis from California if they could. So there's I one do point, which I, I think is an industry that we really need to get our head around. We exist for the patients and the consumers. And so any, anybody who is trying to preserve a broken business model that's broken for the consumer for their own benefit is on the wrong side of history. So I think, you know, in a, in a, and I think as an industry, we get caught in this a lot, right? That, that it's, we're here to serve the patient and not the other way around. And so if you think about that, everything we should be doing should be trying to optimize the best quality product, the freshest, the best possible price, the most selection, the most terpenes, the most variety, the most whatever it is that the consumer wants. That's what we should be here for, not to preserve profit margins and, you know, business models and regulatory capture and stuff like that. So if somebody's not, I don't know the name of anybody, but if somebody's in Massachusetts and they're burning coal and spending 50 grand an acre a month to recreate the Southern California climate that we get for free with no environmental impact, like that's a broken reason to be doing that. Open a store, come up with a brand, buy your cannabis from California, package it locally. Like the microbreweries aren't growing their own hops, right? That doesn't mean that you can't do cannabis. It just means you shouldn't be trying to grow plants where plants don't like to grow. Well, yeah, and I think to the point that we were making at the beginning of the podcast, how we were talking about how, you know, everybody has a, a, in, a theoretically a common goal. I do think as an industry, we could do a better job with common messaging to Washington because I, I have seen just in like the groups that we're part of, like there's different organizations that bring different perspectives and we all do, I do think we all do want the same thing, but I do think there's a lot of people kind of gunning for different interests, which is why it's, you know, it's interesting for all of us to see how it shakes out. But I'm completely on the same page of you as at the end of the day, we need to be doing what's right for the patients, what's right for the customers, the, the end users of, of this product. So it's going to be super interesting to see how it shakes out. Final thing, opt optimism. I think we're up to 24, maybe it's 25 states now that have legalized for adult use. I think it's only three states left that don't have some form of cannabinoid liberalization at this point. So at some point, we're going to almost do this in spite of ourselves, right? I mean, we're, I think we're past the 50% point of the population living in a state that has access to cannabis. The stories that come from that are almost universally good. People have been looking for bad things to say about legalization for a lot of years. It's not there. I mean, collectively, Colorado, Oregon, Washington, California, what do we got? 25 years of adult use and, you know, car rates are up. Opiate deaths are down. Medicare Schedule D spending's down. Car accidents aren't up. I mean, it's the worst thing that people come up with is like more dogs are going to the hospital for eating an edible. Like, you know, give them a glass of water in six hours and they'll be fine, right? Like these... We're, we're every every time a new state legalizes, we're that much closer to this just happening because it can't not. So that's the other thing that keeps me smiling. Yeah, I'm, so I, from what I'm hearing from you, you're in the camp of people need to hang on and make it because there's a massive opportunity. And there, frankly, the opportunity will be even bigger for the people that can make it through this yeah. storm. Yeah, I mean, I, I have no less confidence. And I'm, I'm the most optimistic about cannabis that I've ever been sitting here right now. More good stories, more research, more people with experience. Uh, you know, I think there's more consumers today than there were yesterday and there'll be more tomorrow than there are today. So, you know, this is, again, it's kind of on that path of believing that this is making the world a better place. I think the more people that get exposed to it, the better they are and the more they tell that story and then it becomes a positive you know, cycle that that keeps going. So, um, I, I mean, I think we're going to get there. It's just taking longer and being harder than it should have been needed to be. But Hey, when you're inventing a new frontier and you know, that no one said that that was going to be easy. Yeah. No one said it was going to be easy. And on the, I know we talked about longevity earlier, optimists live 15% longer. So, you know, at least at least, yeah, you, you're going to be living longer. So even if it takes a little bit longer, you're an optimist. So, so, so you'll be alive to see it. Yeah, um, like what, what are, 
it's, I'll send you the article I read that the other day, and I was like, this is great, you know, send it to our whole team. Um, you know, we're coming up on our coming up on, on time here, but, but switching gears internally for your business, what are you most looking forward to for, for your business for the next 12 to 18 months? And if people want to get involved with your business, you know, now's a great opportunity for you to kind of tell them what you have on the horizons and so that maybe they have the chance to, to come and work for you and join your 500 person and, and growing team. Yeah. So, I mean, I think the things uh, that we're really excited about is pushing, you know, pushing forward on uh, the cultivation side. Um, is a big part of what we do. And I think, you know, I've been reading a lot about how, how do you do, how do you produce things better, basically? And produce means grow. It could mean our gummies. It could mean, you know, uh, pre-rolls. But how do you kind of, how do you make things, how do you get better at making things, right? And one of the interesting things out there that I've been reading a lot about is most industries have gone through a path where it starts out and everything's craft and everything's handmade and it's only made by experts. And that's awesome but it's only awesome for about 10% of the population because they all, no one else can afford it. You know, you could look at automobiles are a good example. Back in the 1900s, you had every automobile was a custom made, you know, prototype almost, right? It was a, it was a, it was a piece of art and that was great. And that's really cool. And some of those com- com- companies are still around like Aston Martin and, and things like that, but they're in a very niche thing and very p- few people actually get to benefit and, and be improved by them, right? And then the next stage was mass production. You can think of like Ford and the Model T, right? And they invented some really cool things. And what they did is they made it available to everybody, right? They brought the cost down and they made it a much wider market. But they did it at the cost of uh, customization. They did it at the cost of variety. Um, they did it you know, at a lot of costs. Mass production is very expensive to change things, right? And then you kind of look to where things are on the leading edge now, which you would look at companies maybe like Toyota and companies that are using lean manufacturing techniques where they're taking the, trying to take the best of craft, variety, responsiveness to the consumer, and they're trying to do it with efficiencies that you get at scale production so that you can have stuff tailored to the consumer, but make that consumer the market as big as possible because it's not at pricing that's prohibitive to people. So. You know, a lot of what we're thinking about is how do we connect every, and we're, and we're unique. That's one of the reasons I love being vertically integrated, right? Is we can take it from the seed to the ashtray, right? We, we pick the strains, we propagate them, we grow them, we harvest them, we dry them. We can put them in pre-rolls, we can put them in edibles, we can put them in a jar, right? Like, and then, and then we can bring it directly to the consumer at our stores and learn, do they like it? Did we get it right? Is this the best product out there? Could we do it better? How do we create this variety? We use that as a beta platform. So anything in that kind of lean manufacturing world uh, is something that we're definitely looking at. Uh, We have a great growing team um, and we're really looking to push the boundaries there of how to leverage, uh, you know, the tools that we have, science, technology, um, all kinds of new, lots of research and things like that that we're doing. Cannabis is as a nascent industry, so a, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit and there's a lot to learn there. So people in the R&D space, agronomy, uh, people who love cannabis, of course, um, that you know want to leverage those tools and kind of push the leading edge of technology. And then just you know, folks who uh, love cannabis and want to be a part of the market, again, we're vertically integrated. So it could be from being a bud tender to a store manager to a social media to a grower in the greenhouse, right? We're, we're really looking at all of those and we'd love to talk to people who are passionate um, about cannabis in California and would love to do something that hopefully gets to touch a lot of people's lives and make their day a little bit better. Well, you heard it here first. This sounds like a lot of positions from bud tenders to people in marketing to people um, in the cultivation facility and everything else in between. So it sounds like tons of opportunities to join you Graham, we're, we're at a time that went by very quickly. I definitely am, think we're going to have to do a follow-up episode here, but thanks so much for your time. And I, I can't believe I haven't been out to, to, to your greenhouse. So I'll be there in September, and I, I definitely want to stop by. The door is open. We'd love to have you for a tour, and thanks a lot for having me on, on the show today. Sounds great. Tune in next week, everybody. Have a great week. Yeah.